opportune time. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I continue today in the second sermon in the sermon series, Then and Now, I'm going back about 15 years to a short series that was preached in August of uh, 2009. And uh, my second born had been, is an artist and had been a teacher in uh, Linworth Alternative High School of comic books. And he was headed to Ohio University to continue his artistic work and studies there. And so I did a sermon series on um, those in the comics um, and those in the Bible. And it was a short series with Batman, Superman, and Satan in three sermons. So let us, uh, let us take a look at this one as I've revised it for this day. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Near the end of the 2008 movie about Batman, The Dark Knight, there is a scene that captures the essence of the Joker, the clown prince of crime. The Joker has wired two tugboats with high explosives. At 11 p.m., he kills the engines in both and announces to each of the tugboats that they are set to explode at midnight. Each is filled with thousands of people crossing Gotham City's harbor. However, each boat has a trigger, which if pulled has the power to destroy the other boat and then save themselves. On the one tug are criminals and prisoners from the Gotham City jails and Arkham Asylum for the Criminally Insane, which is the Joker's other home when he's not underground somewhere. On the other tug are families with children and they include officers who had put these men and women behind bars. He broadcasts to both boats who's on the other and then adds this, at exactly midnight I will blow up both tugboats. It is to your advantage to save yourselves before midnight. The clock is ticking. For the next 60 minutes, which in film time is abbreviated considerably, we witness the two sets of people struggle with their existential decision to murder and live or to both be killed together. Everyone knows one thing is clear, that the Joker will kill them all. He has no conscience when it comes to killing. As you watch this scene unfold, having witnessed the Joker create havoc for the first 120 minutes of the film, you feel like you're watching the personification of evil on the screen. He is the killing joke. Moreover, this dangerous and unpredictable arch-villain who invokes mass murder, malignancy, and mayhem is only one of many who create such chaos of this magnitude in the comics. This, the comics are filled with arch-villains who face off against superheroes. In each case, there may be multiple arch-villains for one superhero. For example, Batman has the Riddler, the Penguin, Sandman, and Solomon Grundy. Just bear with me, it's gonna get kind of intense for just a few minutes as we go through a few of them. Right. But each superhero has a special nemesis. In this case, the Joker is Batman's. There's the Green Goblin in Spider-Man. There is Lex Luthor in Superman. There is Magneto for the X-Men and Giganta and Cheetah in Wonder Woman. There's Loki, the evil brother of Thor, Eric Killmonger for the Black Panther, Sinistro in the Green Lantern, and for the battle of Earth itself, Thanos arrives to destroy half of humankind in order to save the other half because he loves humanity that much. That's about as evil as you get. And he's fighting a pantheon of Marvel superheroes, who I will not name, and he and how can any of us forget Red Skull and Doctor Doom and Carnage and Kingpin and the list goes on and on. But then there is Demon. The Demon is the beast unto itself. And it first appears in 1972 in a battle to rule the underworld. The Demon bursts out of his mother's womb and heads to the underworld so he can win the battle to rule over hell. 
Although the demon is the most extreme example, all of the arch-villains have a story of how they came into being. Each has turned to the power of darkness and evil for various reasons. Something inside of each has snapped, and they've chosen a life of crime in response. Is, is it really evil we are witnessing in the arch-villains, or is it just a response to tremendous personal pain and trauma? The debate has been out there for many years. <laughs> We want to believe that each one can be turned around to see the light. We want to believe in redemption. Nevertheless, we are overwhelmed by the violence and the destruction of these men and women. As a reflective people of faith, you and I often struggle to name evil for what it is. I will say in liberal Christian practice, we don't like to talk about it at all. But it is, I believe, no less than an issue of life and death. In People of the Lie, M. Scott Peck came to his defini definition of evil through the eyes of his eight-year-old son, who came up to him one day while he was writing the book, The People of the Lie, and said, Daddy, evil is live, spelled backwards. And Peck said, that's it. He nailed it. How true evil stands in opposition to life. It is that which knowingly and systematically opposes the life force. It has, it has to do with killing sometimes, but evil can, well, I should say that differently. It always has to do with killing, either killing the body or killing the soul or killing the spirit. It is a force residing either inside or outside humans that seeks to kill life and liveliness. And its goodness is the opposite. Goodness is always the force against which evil is fighting. Inside or outside every human being, there is a spirit of goodness and life and restoration and liveliness that goes against evil. Evil is a real spirit of unreality. As human beings and as people of faith, we know the problem evil has and that it's been with us since the earliest times. Satan is called the father of lies. The word Satan itself means adversary. In her book, The Origins of Satan, Elaine Pagels writes, Satan evokes more than the greed, envy, lust, and anger we identify with our worst impulses, and more than what we call brutality, to which human beings um, resist as much as possible because it reminds them of the brutes or the animals. But as you might guess, Scripture paints a varied portrait of Satan over thousands of years of telling his story. As an actual being outside the reality of God, Satan appears only four times in the Old Testament. Very interesting, in Zechariah and Chronicles and Psalm 109, and we know him most in the book of Job. Beyond these four references, it's believed in Hebrew scriptures that God was the one responsible for both evil and good. Isaiah 45, five through seven says it most clearly, I am the Lord and there is no other one besides me. There is no one else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I am the Lord of all these things. In other words, God is the God of the totality of opposites. Everything comes from God, including good and evil. For the ancient Hebrews, there was no problem of good and evil. There was only one God who offered light and dark, blessings and curse, good and evil. This God was boldly and unflinchingly the God that they worshiped, the monotheistic God. Satan as an adversary appears in the shadow side of reality. In this image, the difference between light and dark, good and evil are not that far apart. While we may find the unabashed monotheism of Hebrew scriptures admirable, we may also be troubled by the idea that God is the source of evil as well as good. It should sort of make us think a little. Does God intend evil? Is God amoral? These are questions that are worth wrestling with. Evidently, we are not alone in our struggles. Over 400 years pass between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And in those times and into the New Testament, Satan emerges with conspicuous power. Satan's role is so significant in the New Testament that he has many names. 35 times he's referred to as Satan. 
37 times as Diablos, or the devil. Many times he's called the enemy of all of us. Seven times he's referred to as the Lord of the Flies, or Beelzebub. And he's referred to this ancient deity from Persia because they identify with this name. The Gospel of John frequently refers to the devil and usually refers to him as the prince of this world. Satan continues to mean a being which hinders free forward movement, an adversary, an accuser, a stumbling block. And diablos is the Greek word that is the equivalent. It is literally to throw across is the meaning of the word diablos, as something would be thrown across a path to interfere with our progress. I like to say the one that trips us up, right? The one that just makes, creates chaos and havoc. It happen all sorts of different ways. But Satan is the one who creates the chaos and is responsible for a multitude of human ills in the New Testament. He sends physical ailing and suffering upon humankind to the woman who cannot stand up. In Luke 13, he is, he, she is said to be bound by Satan. He also is responsible for mental afflictions and torturing of humankind. And when Jesus is in the wilderness in the story we just heard, Satan accompanies him there and tries to have him see things his way, right? Doesn't work. In his famous 1946 short story, Chaim Haas, Jewish writer that wrote this story, That's the Way the Goyim Are, says Satan is a bad impulse. But for Christians, he's a lot more than that. Satan is much more than a bad impulse. Satan is named because he appears over and over again as the spirit which is opposed to God. Satan throws every obstacle he can in the path of human beings with torment to body, mind, and soul. He seeks to separate humanity from God as the spirit that opposes what is good. And he incites human beings to sin and rebellion against God, even in the end, overtaking Judas, who sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Rather than the simple and sometimes gray area, exchanging faces with God, Satan is a separate, unimpeachable force that challenges the essence of life itself. We need to know the face of Satan when we see it. And once we have witnessed that face, we need to challenge its existence with determination and courage and care so we don't get sucked into it, but rather stand and speak boldly against it. We also need to be careful not to use the word or name evil when something is not actually that. It's a very dangerous name to unleash, says Scott Peck in the opening word, words of his book, um, People of the Lie. He says, do not use it unless you intend to go into this full force. In his book, When Religion Becomes Evil, I want you to listen to what happens. Charles Kimball names five warning signs of corruption that leads any religion in any manifestation, Christian, Islamic, Jewish, Hindu, others, into the path of evil. He says these five things happen. Number one, the religion claims an absolute truth claim. Number two, they practice blind obedience following a leader who leads them where he wants them to go, and usually it is a he. Number three, establish the ideal time for action to be taken. In other words, whatever it is, this religion says, this is when the end is going to be, and we are going to see to it, right? Number four, justifying the end by any means. And number five, declaring holy war. Wow. The signs can be there if we look for them. But once we become clear of the danger, our task is to be careful in the battle, because those who stand up against evil can get sucked into it too. We must be those who are for God and not simply against evil. In his 1952 book, The Devils of Loudoun, Aldous Huxley describes the development of the psychology of evil in a small 17th century French town. Much like Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, Huxley points out what can become of witch hunting. He writes, the effects which follow too constant and intense a concentration upon evil are always disastrous. Those who crusade not for God in themselves, but against what they perceive as the devil in others, 
never succeed in making the world a better place, but leave it either as it was or something even perceptibly worse than it ever was before their crusade began. By thinking primarily of evil, we tend, however excellent our intentions, to create occasions for evil to manifest itself. Wow. I want to remind you that the Salem witch hunts and witch trials, which were started by people in our own tradition, for those who don't know that, were ended because the governor of Massachusetts, his wife was declared a witch by these folks, and he sent in the troops and shut them down and put them in prison. That's what it took to stop that kind of stuff from going on. No person can concentrate their intentions and their attention upon evil, or even upon the idea of evil, and remain unaffected. To be more against the devil than for God is very dangerous. Every crusader is apt to go mad. They will be haunted by the wickedness they attribute to their enemies, then they will become a part of it. It is here that the comics have an understanding about the complexity of Satan and evil that I don't think most of us do. Each of the arch-villains gets inside their superhero's opponent, their superhero op opponents. They either get under their skin or they get in their heads, and sometimes they actually get into their blood system. They become their shadow side, to paraphrase Carl Jung, but the shadow is the psychological and spiritual concept that refers to the dark, feared, unwanted side of our personality. Everyone has a shadow side. I believe that's true psychologically and spiritually. And each of us need to acknowledge and name the shadow so that it doesn't take us over. It is important to remember, as each of us develop a conscious personality, we all seek to embody in ourselves a certain image of what we would like to be. These qualities that could have become part of this conscious personality, but are not in accord with the person we want to be, are rejected and constitute the shadow personality. So watch out. And we don't have to look far as I wrap this up. The Apostle Paul was dealing with his shadow personality pretty much all through scriptures, in case you didn't know. And here the tumult of his soul hits its apex in Romans 7:14. He writes, I do not understand my own actions. I do not know what I want, but I do, the, I, I do know what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. I can see what is right, but I cannot do it. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the struggles of his soul, Paul points us to the answer of how to come, overcome evil with good. Assailed inside and out, twisted and turned by the battle of his soul with evil, Paul proclaims this truth. God in Jesus Christ is our Savior and can show us the way through the darkness to the light. I couldn't agree more. We have a means through our Savior to get there. When faced with battles in our individual lives, we can find hope for life in Jesus Christ, who seeks to lead us out of darkness into light. And when, when I have stared evil in the eye, and I have looked it in the eye on a number of occasions, the hair standing up on the back of my neck, I have said, either aloud or under my breath, these words of Jesus when he faced such danger, be gone, be gone, Satan. Invoking the name of Jesus when saying these words, I have felt the power and presence of God to cut through danger. In the end of the dark night, as the clock strikes midnight, oh wait, I can't tell you how it ends because that would give away the movie, so um, just, I'll keep going. Just see the movie. <laughs> Overcoming evil with good ultimately is all about the power of God's love. Even as he faced his own shadow, his own demons, the Apostle Paul knew who saved him from the power of evil. He knew the source of his peace of heart and mind. In Philippians 4, 7, he writes, May the peace of God, which passes human understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And now may God strengthen you in every imaginable way as you, in the power of Christ, face and overcome all evil with good. Amen.